Hey everybody. In this video, I'd like to talk a little bit about Immanuel Kant's judgments about the beautiful. So we share the screen here. Let's see here. Okay. Okay. Immanuel Kant was the greatest 18th century German philosopher and one of the most influential figures um, of that in any century. In order to judge something beautiful, according to Kant, it must be a contemplation. Okay, this is kind of complicated sounding, but it must be a contemplation totally unconcerned with the real existence of the object or the thing. So, what is he thinking about here? <clears throat> so, it's contemplation, totally unconcerned with real existence of the thing. Now, it's more than this, but it's sometimes what he calls free play of the imagination. So, you look at a painting, for instance, or a sculpture, and as you're viewing it, you allow your mind to sort of let it free play without any intervention of concepts. Like certainly you don't want to bring any of your own experience into it because it's not about your experience, it's about the formal qualities of what you're looking at, okay? So you want to not care about the existence of the thing. In other words, you don't, you're not thinking about how much of the painting would cost in today's market. You're not thinking about uh, what the provenance of the painting was. You're not thinking about the, um, you know, how, how terrible it would be if somebody stole it or something like that. You're completely what's called disinterested. Now, disinterest is different than, than not being interested. Disinterest is without any particular interest in the thing. In other words, it's not in your interest to think that it's beautiful or not or whatever. It's just all has to do with the qualities of the picture, the formal qualities of the picture, and allowing it to sort of play back and forth in your, in your, in your mind, just as far as it's sensuous or the, the, sense, the sensing uh, organs. <clears throat> Okay. So if you're looking at this uh, picture by Lorraine shooting the stage of Sylvia, you're not thinking about any of the conceptual stuff that you're looking at. You're not thinking about the history of the people or what time it's in. You're just looking at the shapes and the colors and how they interact. And then you, so, so you're not interested in the painting, so to speak. Now you're interested in art. You're interested in in appreciating the painting, but you're not interested in the object itself. So I, I hope I hope that helps. It's a, it's a little it's a little odd of a view. We don't talk about it like this a lot, but um, Kant was a very uh, unique individual, and he had sort of his own language for the for some of these things. And a lot of folks, a lot of our critics, philosophers, artists have found great value in Kant's work. Uh, it's just a matter of being able to sort of make sense of his, the language that he used. <clears throat> so, uh, must be contemplation, totally unconnected, must be something we put on a pedestal, feeling that everyone must find it beautiful too. Now, this is a little controversial when I brought it up to students in the past. This is Kant's view. Kant thinks that judgments of beauty are different than judgments of um, just liking something. So we're going to come back to that. So for instance, uh, if we look at a flower, look at this rose, we can say that we like it, right? Um, Kant thinks we can say it is agreeable to me, right? That we like it. It's agreeable to me. And if somebody says, well, that's just you. I don't like it myself. There's no, th that's fine. That's what we're used to. That's a, the proper use, the appropriate use of the terminology. It's fine if we're the only ones that like it. But consider an artwork, like here, the Guggenheim Museum in Spain. 
to the extent this is an artwork, if I'm making, if you're making, let's put it this way, if you're making an attribution of beauty to say this object, then first of all, you shouldn't be thinking in terms of well, how much did it cost? How many people did it make to put it together? I mean, all those things are fine questions. It's just insofar as it's a work of art, formalists believe that none of that other stuff matters. The only thing that matters is the forms and the colors and how they interact. But with um, Kant, Kant believes that beauty is something that's sort of a, a judgment of beauty. That is, if I say, this is beautiful, that there's an assumption it's not spoken, but it's part of the process of judging something beautiful that we expect other people to agree with us. Okay. Um, sometimes the way I try to describe this is, uh, is the previous one, the rose, um, is, um, it's agreeable. So one is able to agree or disagree, but if, if I'm making a judgment of beauty here, we say it's beautiful, as in it's full of beauty. So the rose is more about us. The beauty of a work of art is more about uh, what the object itself has. You can kind of think of it that way. So that the expectation is, is that people will agree with us. You know, Maybe it's a little bit like you think of ethics. Uh, if we say, um, you know, um, yeah, I don't know. Somebody hits somebody else for no reason, and we say, wow, that was wrong. And if somebody else says, huh, well, that's just you, I don't agree. We would kind of think, wow, really? You don't agree with that? Because uh, for a lot of folks, um, just kind of Kant's making a, a social, it's kind of a, partly a social commentary here. Um, of course, we all want to let people make their own decisions and be tolerant of different views and all that. But this is about the, tech, the technical aspect of making a judgment of beauty. <clears throat> okay, I think I maybe rambled too much on that. So, <clears throat> um, similarly here, I just like to try to throw in art examples when I can. Chart Cathedral in France. I just went to France last summer. Uh, went to a lot of museums, was not able to, uh, didn't have a chance to make it to the Chartres Cathedral. I would have loved to do that. It's not very far from Paris. If you have a chance, I understand. It's really a good, a must-see thing to, to do. <clears throat> so, let's see. Uh, okay, so my judgment of beauty must be an interest in the object as form only, like as the, the shapes and colors of the thing only, apart from any concept. Our imagination is at play in the contemplation of the outward form. This is just sort of a technical way of just saying you're just looking at something and enjoying looking at it. Um, but of course, he tries to be a little more precise with that and say that it's not about the concepts, it's just about the way things look. We must presuppose the existence of a common sense in order to um, make judgments of beauty. Not exactly, not a common sense in the sense of a shared understanding. Like we sometimes might say, hey, what do you, you have no common sense. Um, that common sense is something that's, uh, that's a little bit different from what he's talking about. He's talking about a shared feeling in judgments of taste. Um, that have what he calls universal validity. It's a, it's a shared feeling. Kant thinks that beauty is something that we can all share in the experience, uh, meaning roughly that we all have the same experience of it. Now that's, that's rough. It's not, obviously we don't all have the exact same experience of it, but um, he means in terms of our shared sense, our shared feelings, uh, when it comes to the beauty of a human-made object, an artwork, this, uh, this has, according to Kant, universal validity. So whenever we make a judgment about beauty. 
Okay. <clears throat> every art, and it's the last point here, is that he thinks every art presupposes rules, but unlike other arts, the rules cannot be shared with others, cannot have a concept, as in like science. So you can take somebody through a science experiment. You know, teachers of science can lead someone in the laboratory to do certain things, and um, there's, a, there's methodology to it. Kant thinks there's no methodology in art, that uh, a real work of art is made by someone who doesn't even know the rules themselves and certainly can't teach it to others, but just has a kind of maybe innate ability is a way to think about it. Just they're born with the ability to do this. Um, Kant doesn't say much in terms of what art education would be like, so I'm not sure what the role would be if the only people that can make art would be the geniuses um, who can't explain it to others. But this is his view, and it's been an influential view, and I think it's interesting, it's worth talking about, worth, worth discussing, certainly. So genius is the innate mental, in other words, talent or aptitude through which nature, what he says is nature gives the rule to art. So in other words, you think of it in kind of fanciful terms, that nature is this, this big encompassing thing that nature sort of works through humans by, um, you know, nature wants to, to give the rules to make art, but it can't give actual rules. And so it creates geniuses. Okay. So genius uh, is originality. Genius must be exemplary, must be a standard for others. So other so the way you would learn art, I guess this would be the answer to the art education question, would be we would learn art by, um, by observing others, uh, the artwork of other geniuses, and then we try to kind of copy that in some way, not like copy the actual work of art, but sort of try to try to get whatever that uh, indescribable uh, sense is, so that nature is working through humans. We're not talking about a religious aspect here, of like God working through humans. We're talking about kind of thought it was nature working through humans to make art to create a standard for others to follow. Okay. Um, also. Genius isn't aware of how she does it, right? Um, and it's prescribed by nature to fine arts, not to science. So science is, uh, we can get rules in science, as I said, but not in art. And so that's all I have right now on this article. If you have any questions, let me know. I'm sure you've never seen this before, in case you haven't. This is a cat sitting funny, and I hope you enjoy it, and I hope uh, you have a nice day. Thank you for your time and attention. Bye-bye.